Welcome to Stanford Legal, where we look at the cases, questions, conflicts, and legal stories that affect us all every day. I'm Pam Carlin, along with Joe Bankman. Hi, Joe. Hi, Pam. So, you know, people say that the only things that are certain in America are death or taxes, but I actually think elections are pretty certain as well, at least for now. And one of the things that you notice is every couple of years we have another election cycle, and each one is different from the one before in interesting and important ways. And one of the things we find, Pam, is that more and more legal experts are getting involved in our elections. That is, each election raises legal issues that everyone's talking about. And I don't remember this in the past. When I went to law school, Pam, election law wasn't a subject. You could take civil rights, it might have been part of that, but we didn't have election law experts. Yeah, and one of the things that's happened, and I think this is where my career has has played a role, is seeing the connection between all of these different parts of the law that governs our elections, campaign finance, redistricting, the right to vote, reapportionment, uh, all regulation of political parties. And so one of the things is that we've started talking about something called the law of democracy. That is the legal structure of the political process. And that's what I've specialized in in my career. But we also have another guest with us today who's also a specialist in this. Joe? <laughs> and our guest is again Nate Persley. Uh, Nate has been uh, a member of our faculty for uh, a lucky number of years for us. Uh, uh, you've, uh, you've heard him before when we talked about uh, the Pennsylvania redistricting and before that. And Nate, you're going to be back here both as a lawyer and a political science and a member of our faculty to talk to us about the election law that we're looking at right now. But before we do that, Nate, I want to welcome you and ask you to talk about the last election. Give us an overview of how you see what happened. Well, uh, this last election was extraordinary and unprecedented in a number of ways. Uh, a record number of people voted for a midterm election, 117 million people. And uh, usually, if I could just stop you there for a second, usually turnout goes way down in these midterm elections where the president isn't on the ballot, right? Well, that's right. I mean, th this, just to give you a sense, in 2014, only 83 million people turned out. In 2010, it was higher, but it was 91 million. 117 million people, that's general election numbers. I mean, you had roughly 130 million in the 2016 election, and so this is really comparable. And in some ways, it's, it's a miracle we pull, pulled it off, given all the sort of various election dysfunction that we have experienced over the last few years. The election administrators actually did uh, come through. Um, but it was not just in the number of people uh, who voted, but also in the results. Uh, the 40 seats that the Democrats picked up in the House of Representatives uh, is a high watermark for them um, since uh, the Watergate era. That is to say, the shift in the House of Representatives was the largest Democratic pickup uh, since the early 1970s. Um, uh, the Democrats did not pick up uh, seats in the Senate. Actually, the Republicans did, so that you have a 53-47 split in the Senate. That also has never happened before, where you would have one party has gained so much in one house and yet loses in the other, uh, so much to, to gain control in, in, in uh, another house. And uh, the Democrats picked up seats in uh, several hundred seats in state legislatures, uh, many governorships. Uh, and so it was a Democratic wave to to some extent, we only realized that a month or so after the elections when uh, these mail ballots were eventually uh, counted. But it was really transformative uh, to the political landscape in the U.S. And beyond that, beyond the actual offices that the Democrats won, there was also some notable initiatives that were on the ballot that uh, passed in several states. In many ways, democracy itself was on the ballot so that in places like Florida, which overturned its felon disfranchisement law, that was uh, remarkable. Um, and that means several hundred thousand more people can vote in Florida in the next election, right? Oh, actually, over one and a half million people in Florida will be able to vote uh, now who couldn't previous to that. Uh, the, the felon disfranchisement law in, law in Florida uh, disenfranchised one out of four or five African-American men in in Florida, as well as uh, you know hundreds of thousands of others. Uh, and so we'll see whether they turn out to vote, but now they, they have the capacity, the, the ability to do so. And then in other states like uh, Maryland and Nevada, they made voting easier through uh, convenience voting, automatic registration, and the like. Uh, and then four states passed redistricting reform, Colorado, uh, Missouri, Utah, and um, 
uh, I think, uh, Michigan. And so uh, you you really had, like I said, democracy was on the ballot. There was an, uh, you know, a lot of reform that was passed in order to get at what were seen as sort of pathologies that had developed in the last decade or so. So tell us a little bit about the pathologies that those laws were intended to kind of respond to. I think people are realizing that gerrymandering is infecting U.S. democracy in ways that it hadn't previously, or if it had, we weren't as aware of it. And so um, perhaps this is because that the in, say, the 2000. Uh, 12 election uh, and subsequent that there were times when the Democrats would win a majority of votes, but they wouldn't win a majority of seats, say, in Congress. And in many states, uh, that was still true. So uh, you ended up with these huge distortions uh, in different states, depending on which uh, party was in control of the redistricting process. And I should say it's not just a, uh, you know, a Republican phenomenon in places like Chicago, in uh, Illinois and Maryland, the Democrats gerrymandered the Republicans, but uh, in, in places like Pennsylvania, Ohio, uh, Michigan, uh, and Wisconsin, the Republicans were con- in control in 2010 and then uh, drew favorable gerrymanders. Now, Nate, when, when gerrymandering is thought to be a problem, of course, the party that loses from gerrymandering always thinks it's a problem. And, and maybe some other observers do. Sometimes courts do. And sometimes when courts think it's a problem, they look to redraw districts. And I know you've been involved in that. Can you just tell us what that entails? You've done a lot of that. Sure. I've, I've done quite a bit of redrawing in this cycle and then the previous cycle. I was involved in the court-drawn plans in New York, Connecticut, and Pennsylvania this cycle for Congress. And then I was the special master in North Carolina recently for their state legislative districts. And then the previous uh, cycle, I was involved in New York, Georgia, uh, Maryland. I think that, that covers I mean, the One of the things lot. that's striking is like you've actually participated in helping courts draw one out of 11 – Congressional districts in the United States is that right? That's true in the in the current um, uh, the current maps, yeah. So uh, that when you when you deal with large states like New York and uh, Pennsylvania, the, the the numbers add up. Are so, you salivating to get a chance? No, in no, Texas? I I don't know. It's uh, yeah, <laughs> it it ends up um, you know I, I, your radio listeners can't can't see this, but the boldness on my head is due to these court drawn redistricting processes. These are very high intensity, stressful. Uh, emergency proceedings because they only call in an expert when the political process has failed and they need an emergency plan uh, in time to run elections. And so why I get appointed depends on the circumstances. In some cases, like in Connecticut and and New York, it's because the parties could not agree. So if it's a split legislature or the governor and the legislature have to sign on to a plan, um, they there's an impasse, and so it falls to the courts to draw just a plan that will be constitutional for the upcoming elections. Uh, in Pennsylvania, the state Supreme Court had struck down the plan, the congressional plan, as violating the state's uh, right to vote provision because it was an excessive partisan gerrymander. And so I was appointed to help the court in addressing the partisan bias in the underlying plan. So let me just stop you there for a sec to make it clear to the listeners. Sometimes it's that the political process can't draw a plan at all. They're just deadlocked. And sometimes it's the political process drew a plan, but there's some constitutional problem with the plan it drew or some problem under federal law with the plan. That's right. And so in the when I was special master in North Carolina because the districts were, were considered to be a racial gerrymander. And I mentioned all these specific infirmities because depending on the reason that someone is appointed, the plan will look different because I'm there to solve a problem. Uh, if the the, if the problem is that they need a plan for the for the election, often it means that um, and and it's because there was an impasse. I use usually the the current lines and then try to adjust them in order to uh, make them constitutional. If it's a racial gerrymander, then you draw a plan to make sure to address those districts where the court found that there was a racial gerrymander. This is Stanford Legal, and today we're talking with our colleague Nate Persley about election law, past, present, and future. Nate, you were telling us about your role in helping courts draw plans. And so a court comes to you, uh, Pennsylvania might be the most recent one. There, there was a constitutional infirmity. It wasn't a deadlock. How would you go about even starting that process? Do you have a computer program? Do you kind of eyeball it and say, we'll put Altoona over here? And what do you do? (laughs) Well, first, what you want to 
look at is the actual plan that exists at the time to really understand how the pieces fit together and also what the court found was most disturbing about it so that you don't replicate those problems. Um, but what I often like to do is to get wall-sized maps of the state, put them in an empty room, and sit and stare at them for about five or six hours to understand how the different pieces of the map fit together, how who lives where, where there might be, say, voting rights issues under the Voting Rights Act, so you want to make sure you um, deal with potential racial vote dilution, uh, to get a sense of, you know, um, where the population concentrations are because while it's everybody always has this inclination to draw boxy districts, that doesn't really work when you get down to trying to comply with one person, one vote. So I use a computer program called Maptitude for Redistricting <laughs> uh, by Caliper Corporation. It's a pretty expensive program, but it's the one that most redistricting experts use. It has all of the maps that um, are available through the Census Bureau, as well as all the census data. So it has 126 different racial and ethnic combinations for every person uh, in the state. And it has um, all kind, I can put up all the railroads and the schools and the um, and the mountain ranges, all kinds of features to get a sense of how the, the population sort of travels in a particular area and, and um, what it looks like. Um, and then the principles that I use to draw maps really depends often on what the court instructs me to do. Um, if it's a, a case where I'm trying to just equalize the population, often with minimal disruption to the lines, um, then it just requires, you know, making sure that things are are relatively equal. If it's about— And that's because people could have moved between the last census and this census. I mean, one of the things I used to say about this was— you know, it's a little bit like, um, and Pennsylvania was an example of this, the population didn't change that much from one decade to the other, but it moved around, kind of like the way as you get older, your weight might not change, but it <laughs> shifts around. Remember the Lee commercial about, you know, you need a scooch more room in the legs and thighs? And it's sort of like that, that it, 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 people move in that 10 years and, and you got to redraw the district. That's right. And I put a, put a girdle on the state to make sure that everything <laughs> is uh, put back together. Um, and so... Uh, so, for example, in Connecticut, where I was the special master, um, I made minimal the, – the, the fewest number of changes to the lines in order to adjust uh, to comply with one person, one vote because it was pretty easy to do that. Um, in other situations, you really can't use the existing plan because the plan itself is unconstitutional um, and is so pervasively unconstitutional that you have to draw from scratch. And you can also have a problem there if a state loses or gains congressional seats because yeah. then you got to draw additional ones. And just to – say that we're here with Nate Persley on Stanford Legal talking about redistricting and regulation of the election process. But Nate, you were saying, Nate, about how you drew them. Yeah. Well, so, um, you know, if you uh, – just to give you some war stories as to sort of lessons I've learned in this. So there are times – I remember when I, when I uh, was involved in the Georgia redistricting before, which was addressing a one-person, one-vote violation, but you had to really redraw almost the entire state because it was a de an extreme Democratic gerrymander – uh, that the court wanted me uh, to help resolve. Uh, I drew a wonderful square district in northern Georgia. Um, it looked great on the map, but it turned out there was a mountain range right in the middle. So you actually couldn't go from one side of the district to the other without going outside of the district. And so while these sort of blocks of color on the page really look rational, sometimes when you get down to it, uh, just because something looks like a nice Mondrian painting doesn't mean it's the best redistricting plan. So take us to your most recent one, Pennsylvania. It's a constitutional challenge. You're advising the court. First of all, you're in a room with maps on the wall. Do you have a team to do this? Is this a solo exercise? Well, um, it generally is a solo exercise. Um, I, uh, I'm going to just speak generally about about different yeah. cases. So, so um, I often have someone who helps me who does some of the. I won't call it the artwork, but start trying to make the maps that I produce look really good. Yeah. Um, I will sometimes uh, – there's usually lawyers involved to help with the the paper. There really wasn't – I in, because of the rushed process in Pennsylvania, there wasn't um, much in the way of like me having to write and exp explain my uh -huh. decisions and the like um, um, because the court itself uh, uh, wrote all of that up. Um, but if you look in – when I'm an – 
either when I'm uh, expert assistant to special masters or when I'm the special master, it'll often be you know several hundred pages of documents that I'll uh, write up about why I made the changes that I did, um, why I rejected proposals that have come in. Usually when I'm a special master, what I like to do is have the parties um, submit proposal to me. I then evaluate them. I draw a draft plan. I ask them to comment on the plan. And then I incorporate comments that I think are reasonable and explain why I reject others. And then I have to argue in front of the court as to why I think this is the plan that should be adopted. And so it sounds to me almost like what you're doing is a little bit like what some of the redistricting reforms would have done in every case. That is, have experts draw the plan, listen to the various parties and the like, as opposed to having the legislature draw its own plan. I think that's right. And and different reforms have different ways of going about this. So I often say that the the reforms either are going at trying to reform the people, the principles of the process, right? Who draws the map, what principles they have to abide by, and how they do it. And so uh, depending on which state we're talking about with these recent reforms, you'll have different um, uh, reforms to the process. So a state like Florida, which passed a redistricting reform uh, p- before the last redistricting, really just changed the principles. The legislature still is drawing it, but uh, then they get sued. And um, if they draw a partisan gerrymander and it goes into court. The, uh, California uh, has this kind of Rube Goldberg uh, 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 redistricting commission which is really made of mainly novices, but they have done a relatively good job in the last uh, go-round. So, you know, it, it, one of the other things that you're an expert in, you're an expert in so many things, it's really like I feel there must be three Nate Persilies on the faculty, um, is you've done some comparative work. You took students to India to do comparative law of democracy there. And is the United States distinctive in having politicians draw a lot of their own districts, or is that the way it operates around the world? Yes, um, we are distinctive and we have, uh, you know, since our founding, we have a pervasive distrust of centralized authority and nonpartisan authority, right? And so this um, – uh, the system that we have here really is is not replicated anywhere in the world. Um, they trust civil servants to do most of this work. What what difference does it make, Nate? Can you give us some states and point out if you have independent people draw uh, a map and if you've got – uh, the legislature doing it. Give us some some war stories, some compare and contrasts here. Let me give you an example from from Georgia when I was appointed uh, to help the special master there draw the lines uh, last decade. So uh, <coughs> in Georgia, uh, the Democrats, in order to maintain control of the state legislature, um, com- Basically, they diluted the Republican vote in the suburbs. They drew multi-member districts in order to try to to, to have urban centers um, um, sort of disproportionately outnumber the suburban areas. They drew districts that when I show them to my students on a map, they think they're rivers because they go from one part of the state to the other, these sort of thin blue lines. Um, and so that was the only way that the Democrats were going to uh, remain in charge in Georgia. It was a Republican state or becoming more Republican at the time. Um when we were appointed and drew districts that were based on compact theories of compactness and political subdivision lines and equal population, uh, the effect was dramatic. Um, and so the Democrats then lost control of the Georgia state legislature. Um, the districts were more coherent. They respected sort of known communities and the like. And, um, and the political power shifted. Well, we'll be back with more from our guest, Nate Persley, about – regulation of the political process and going forward what we can expect next on Stanford Legal here on Sirius XM Insight 121. Welcome back to Stanford Legal, where we look at the cases, questions, conflicts, and legal stories that affect us all every day. I'm Pam Carlin, along with Joe Bankman. Joe? Uh, Pam, uh, Nate, uh, just a minute ago, I asked you, what difference all this redistricting make? And you gave me the example of Georgia a number of years ago with uh, absurdly shaped districts that dramatically affected the makeup of the uh, uh, the, represent- the representation people got. How about in 2018? Give me a compare and contrast. What happened in Pennsylvania after the redistricting and contrast that with, with another state or two? So before the uh, court struck down the plan, um, 
of the 18 districts in Pennsylvania, uh, Republicans had won 12 or 13 consistently throughout the decade. And uh, despite the fact that Pennsylvania is at best a purple state and usually uh, uh, tending blue, but it's a, it's a very competitive state. Um, after the redistricting, it's now split 9-9, even though uh, the Democrats actually won 10 percent uh, more votes than the Republicans. But so it moved from Democrats having – they picked up three seats, moving from 6-12 uh, to 9-9. Uh, in places like Wisconsin and most notably North Carolina, which also experienced gerrymanders, um, you didn't see any of that shift, um, uh, North Carolina most significantly, which is actually a case that's going up to the Supreme Court as we speak, uh, partisan gerrymandering case. Uh, the Democrats, uh, despite winning, um, you know, having more votes uh, than they did previously, did not pick up any seats. Um, and, you know, the, what happens is that with, with these partisan gerrymanders, not only uh, could you end up with that misrepresentation, but you also get a lot of candidates who don't end up running in these unfair districts to make yeah, them competitive. One of the things I thought was most striking in Wisconsin was they had a gubernatorial election this time around and a attorney general election. And the governorship switched to the Democrats, the attorney generalship switched to the Democrats, and yet the Republicans have a lock on the state legislative districts. And can you say a little bit about what happened after the election? Because I think it's kind of striking, and a lot of our listeners may not have been following this. I'll say that that phenomenon you're describing has actually happened in almost all of these states that were gerrymandered by Republicans, with the exception of Ohio. So Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and North Carolina all have Democratic governors right now. Um, only Pennsylvania's congressional district uh, delegation flipped. Uh, but after the election, what we're seeing in both North Carolina and in, in Wisconsin were measures taken to try to strip the governor of powers, uh, to try to sort of in one last gasp in the lame duck session to try and um, minimize the uh, powers that the governor can exercise, uh, the newly elected governor can exercise to try to enforce uh, laws that they might not like. And, and I should just say one thing here just as another plug for Stanford, which is the new attorney general of Wisconsin is Josh Call, uh, who is an alumnus of the law school. Uh, can you give us an example, Nate, of the – or Pam, because you're both experts on this, of a law that the legislature passed in in Wisconsin that would raise eyebrows? Sure. So one of the things that Josh Call ran on, one of his platform things was – uh, he was going to take the state out of a lawsuit challenging the Affordable Care Act because Democrats in general support the Affordable Care Act. And so when voters voted for him, one of the things they were voting on, because this was one of the centerpieces of his campaign, was I will not continue to sue the federal government the way the Republican previous attorney general was suing. And the state legislature has tried to pass a law to say you can't take us out of that lawsuit. Which kind of nullifies why, in part why the voters elected Josh. Thank you. That was what I was thinking of too. Yeah, I mean that's the that's the easiest that's the easiest to explain quickly. You kind of extend your reign past when the voters are done with you. Yeah, it's kind of like you know blowing up the city as you leave it. Um, so I, I wondered if we could talk also a little bit about you had said earlier. Boy, one of the noticeable things about this election was the huge increase in turnout. And we've been talking a lot in past couple of years about vote suppression and vote fraud. Have we kind of gotten beyond that now or are the same problems cropping up in a new way? I think the voting wars are still with us and that we are um, – the, the battle over integrity on the one hand or anti-fraud on the other, on, on one hand and then access on the other has now taken on a real partisan valence. And that is sort of new in many ways for American politics over the last 15 years. Uh, and so the, we have – uh, we're certainly not past it. We've seen uh, increasing efforts in different states to try to restrict the, the right to vote. Um, and the quality of democracy uh, that Americans experience really does depend on which state they live in. So this is Stanford Legal, and we're talking with our colleague Nate Persley about the election wars. Nate, what about the next war? Um, what do you see coming up in 2020? Well, you know, as Yogi Berra said, it's, uh, you know, predictions are especially difficult, especially about the future. Uh, uh, but we can get some idea about what, what's coming down the pike. I think there's It's not going to be deja vu all over again. It could be, right. It, it's sort of, uh, there, 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 
there are certain things that I think are are obvious that we're going to continue to be fighting over, and then there's there are sort of known unknowns. The first is um, that these these fights over uh, access to the ballot are going to continue, whether it's voter identification or citizenship qualifications or restrictions on early voting. This continues to be uh, sort of the drama that plays out in the uh, period before. An election. Uh, I think we're seeing this also with the way people vote. So there's now a lot of attention to absentee and mail ballots, in part because of this, this um, what, what appears to be an, a, an example of election fraud in a congressional district in uh, North Carolina. So there's going to be greater scrutiny of absentee and mail ballots, which are really uh, increasing around the United States. Uh, and then because of the Russian intervention in the 2016 election, I think cybersecurity, both of the machines and the registration systems and the electronic poll books, is going to be top of mind for a lot of people. Talk about the cybersecurity issues for a second, Nate. Well, uh, in the 2016 election, the Department of Homeland Security designated um, the election system infrastructure to be critical infrastructure, that designation is the kind of thing that we we say about banks and telecommunication systems and the like, which is that this is a critical technical infrastructure in the United States that requires a national response because you have malicious actors from, you know, whether it's Russia, China, uh, um, non-state actors who are trying, who could potentially get involved to change the results. Uh, that's just on the machines and on the technical side of things. Then the question of how foreign actors are and, and others are affecting social media and the campaigns is something I think, you know, that's now become a pervasive uh, topic of discussion in the run-up to elections. Um, but just on the on the basic technical questions of voting machines and the like, I think they, this, this happened in Georgia this time around, as well as in some other states. There's real concern about the age of the voting systems that we have and their security. And so I think you'll start seeing some uh, innovation in that area. And the other thing that's going to happen in 2020, beyond an election and an important election is we're going to hold another census. How does the census play into all of this? I have to say that the, the census is one of the sleeper issues that Americans are not paying attention to right now because it's not top of mind, but in many ways could really transform the political landscape around the country. Um, the administration is trying to do something unprecedented in recent years, which is to add a citizenship question onto the census. And what this will do is certainly have an effect on uh, non-citizens who, who would be counted in the census who might be concerned about revealing their non-citizenship uh, and, and, status. And we should say to our, our listeners, as a matter of law, the census is not supposed to share that information with anyone else. That is, when you answer a, sen a s census question, the census doesn't then send that to ICE or to the Department of Homeland Security or anything. That's right. And and so on the one hand, the message needs to be sent that the, you know, the the responses on the census form are private and and confidential and will be protected. On the other hand, uh, in this environment, when in particularly in the discussions over immigration and the like, you can understand why people might be concerned about the effect of adding a citizenship question onto the census and how that might affect response rates around the country. Well, you know, we've been talking with you, Nate, about election law, and this is the second time you've come on, and it seems to really have a tremendous effect in so many ways in terms of how we draw the districts, in terms of who gets to vote, in terms of uh, uh, what lame duck uh, actors can do, in terms of how we protect the integrity of our systems. Uh, I hope you'll come back again as some of these things get resolved in the next few months, or at least we we stumble uh, toward a resolution of some kind. Yeah, I'd be surprised if we actually get these things resolved. There's always new problems, and I'm happy to come back and talk about. Yeah, those I mean, as one well. of the great things about this area of law, and I think Nate and I have both been in it really since it became an area of law, is you get a new problem every time you get a new solution. So thanks to our listeners very much, and thank you, Nate, for joining us here on Stanford Legal, here on Sirius XM Insight 121.